Well, I would like to welcome you all to the National Heritage House here in Reykjavik. And it's an honor to welcome the Foreign Minister of Iceland, Lilia Alfredsdóttir, who is going to address us with a few words. Thank you very much, Ögmundur. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I have looked at your agenda and it's very ambitious, addresses key challenges that we are looking at as regards to human rights. So I'm privileged to uh, start the morning with you and uh, I am certain that you will have extremely interesting uh, days ahead. So now I'll start with my, my, my formal speech. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, Human rights have been a cornerstone of Icelandic foreign policy for a long time. They are also mainstream, mainstream through our development cooperation and a major theme in all our bilateral, rela bilateral relations. Human rights are at the epicenter of most of the current crisis uh, today. Conflicts and instability that have displaced more people than ever since the World War II and human rights violations are both the cause and the effect of the situation that we are faced, to, faced with today. They're also at the core of the political debate in many democratic societies, where extremist voice <coughs> threaten to undermine the respect of human rights. This is a very troubling trend, and we have to fight it by all means, and everyone needs to be united on that issue. How we managed to do that will bear witness on how strongly we are committed in reality to our hard-won rights. These rights did not come about easily. Their development and codification is one of the greatest accomplishments of our common efforts through multilateral cooperation, especially the United, Station, United, United Nations since the World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, as a leader in gender equality, we have put a particular focus on advancing gender equality and empowerment of women. Thus, we advocate for the implementation of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This carries, a, carries on legal obligations to, most, to where most states are parties. We are also focused on the implementation of other international commitments, such as the Beijing Platform for Action and UN Security Council Resolution 1325. In addition, we have been very keen on expanding the pool of active stakeholders in advancing gender equality by engaging men and boys. For these purposes, under the leadership of my predecessor and in good cooperation with Suriname, Iceland has developed the so-called barbershop concept, creating a platform for men to discuss their part in advancing gender equality. <coughs> it is my firm belief that actively engaging men and boys in this effort is crucial for advancing women's rights. Barbershop events have already taken place at the UN headquarters in New York and in Geneva, as well as NATO headquarters in Brussels with high-level participation. Further advance, further advance are in the planning for the OSCE and the Council of the Baltic Sea States. It is my hope that this initiative will help advance the discussion and the necessary mindset to achieve equal rights for women and men. Of course, champions of human rights abroad must deliver on its own international human rights obligations. We are currently preparing our universal, our universal periodic review to be examined before the Human Rights Council in November. It is an opportunity to look inwards and encourage dialogue with civil society on human rights in Iceland and benefit from external examinations, which we, which we greatly appreciate and think is necessary. We believe that the EU that the UPR system has been a great step forward in putting all UN member states at the same footing by having to go through scrutiny by their peers on a regular basis. The UPR works as an accountability mechanism for a, to a certain extent, and it is extremely important for all UN member states to participate in the UPR system in good faith. 
as well as to work with special procedures set by the Human, by the human Rights Council. The same applies also to the human rights treaty bodies where state parties have committed themselves to be examined <coughs> at regular intervals ab about how they implement the treaty obligations. Despite political, despite political complexities, the international human rights system has the potential to, assess, to assist states in upholding their obligations, increasing respect for human rights, and while doing so, creating a more stable world. No state can today claim that human rights are an international affair. This is simply not acceptable. Human rights are universal. I thank you very much for the opportunity to open this round table, and I wish you a very interesting discussions and good days ahead. Thank you very much. I would like, on our behalf, to thank the Foreign Minister of Iceland, Lilia Alfredsdóttir, for her welcoming remarks and uh, thoughtful comments on some of the burning issues of the day. I think our contribution to the stability in Icelandic politics would be to facilitate for the minister to get to work as soon as possible. So, thank you very much.